What do you got? I got chocolate uh, lollipops. Want a chocolate lollipop? <laughs> Many of you know my dad passed away in November, November 26th. He was 83. He turned 84 on December 3rd. Just a couple of weeks later would have been his 84th birthday. My dad has been my teacher, and I've said it many times and in many Instagram posts. Everything I do is because of my dad. This whole universe I've created is because my dad presented the opportunity for me to learn how to do all the things that I do. And in honor of my dad, to honor him and to make it clear how much of an inspiration he was to me and where I am today, I made a list. I asked my brothers and my sister to try and remember all the various little tips that my dad has given us over the years. And this is a very incomplete list because it's the type of thing, as I remember, I write them down or as I experience them. Now, I'm going to demonstrate as many of these as I can. And I just want to make a point. Every time I do these tips, I remember the moment my dad taught them to me. And it's just very powerful to keep in mind that when you teach your children or you teach your friends and family certain tricks that stay with them, that very moment in time stays with you. And I could remember as clear as day nearly all these tricks. The moment my dad taught them to me when I was 8, 9, 7, 12, 15, 25, 30, whatever moment in time it was. And I want to show them to you and I want to honor my dad. Watch this. Let's see. He's not slowing it down for you. Many of these tips are repeats you might have seen over the years, but in the context of this video, I just want to show you that the things my dad specifically taught me. I might have showed you them in the past, but I didn't tell you how I learned them. Now, the idea of cutting a piece of material and flipping it over so that you don't have to chase it on the other side of a saw. I learned this on a job site saw. There are obviously many instances there's no need to do this in a shop. I don't have an outfeed table, but I got used to doing this and I've been doing it for the last 40 years. Where'd you get this jacket? It's a long time ago at the, the Woody. Okay. I bought it was brand new, five dollars. This is a real simple tip, but I remember being yelled at until I actually got it and never did it wrong again. While my dad was up on a ladder or had his head under a sink, hand me the drill driver. You must always hand it to somebody handle first. So when they're like this, with their hand up like that, don't hand it to them like this because then they have to organize it with their other hand and put it into their hand like this. Always hand it to them so it's ready to be used. My dad overemphasized that every single time. A lot of tips my dad repeated over and over again. I'm sure I do that as well. But uh, even into my late adulthood, my dad would say, now when you hand somebody a drill driver or a hammer, hand it to them handle first. And I never forgot that. And now when I'm with other guys and I do that, they're like, ah, you learned good. You must have been taught by somebody that knows what they were doing. You gotta remember, I, I'm 57 years old, so I grew up my whole life with my dad reminding me, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean. Now it's if you got time to scroll, you got time to clean. Don't forget, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean. This is Carmel. Yeah. And then under it is green. Uh, oh, that's right. You gave that to the dog. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I yeah. eat them all day long. Yeah. How's the dog doing? Good. All right. Good. I walked him this morning. All right. My dad wasn't much of a metal worker, but occasionally he would grind stuff on the sander. And he was always conscious of fire, starting fires. And sparks could set powdered sawdust on fire near, just about immediately. And that's why I always use metal garbage cans and I keep the lid nearby so that I could immediately close it in case there's a fire in the garbage can or to prevent a fire. And this is specifically because my dad constantly was worrying about fire in the wood shop. 
So it's really important. I personally always use metal cans because plastic ones can catch on fire and then cause a bigger fire that's harder to put out. With a metal can, you could smother it or just prevent it altogether by having the lid nearby. This was my tip. I've been doing this for many years and my dad was always impressed. He did this to his stuff that I taught him. This is the story of the candy and the cake. You ever hear of this play? Everything oh, five is below. below five hours. Five below. This was more of a job site tip that my dad would often do. You're on a job site and there's a big Rubbermaid bin. When you're done with the broom, stick the broom in the bin so that everybody on the job site knows where the broom is. It's not leaning in a closet that's half built or something like that. The bin and the broom are always together. Potentially you have a dustpan hooked on the edge too as well. Stupid stuff, but makes life simple. It's a parking spot right here. It's all right? Is this good? I guess. <laughs> too far away? You want me to drop you off and come back? No, it sounds good. You go back and see if you get closer. <laughs> okay. I might lose this spot though. If you have heavy stuff to move and you're in an apartment, you're in a place that has fancy floors and you don't have rubber wheels, plop your object onto a towel or a piece of carpet or more appropriately if you're in that circumstance, a moving blanket. Pile up three moving blankets and pull whatever that object is. It could be a plant, it could be a marble sculpture, it could be a refrigerator, something that could potentially scratch the floor. You eliminate all that by dragging it on a towel, blanket, or a moving blanket. My dad taught me that 50 years ago. That's some camera. Is it recording there? Huh? For this next tip, I don't have the best demonstration, but I think you can understand that whenever we moved anything heavy, for instance, a dresser, which I don't happen to have right now to move, but if you tip a dresser back and you put a dolly under it, it is important to pick the dolly up to the angle that the bottom is at, so that when you stand it up, it pivots on the wheels and goes down. Now, I'll do a demonstration of that. The reason you want to do this is so that you can have a controlled tip, especially if this was something big and heavy and tall, like a refrigerator or, or a dresser, like I said. So if you have your assistant here tipping it up like that, you can take this, put it directly underneath it, and now you can control it coming down and it'll pivot on the wheels and you can put it down gently. If you didn't do that, the consequence would be something like this. If this was very heavy, a safe for instance, as you tilt down onto here, you're going to cause the dolly to pivot like that and it might slap up and it's jarring. Maybe nothing will go wrong, but it's, it's not controlled. So look at that. Then you move it. Flashlight? Yeah. This next tip my dad taught me 35 years ago when the first miter box saws came out. We used to call them chop saws. And when they first came out, my dad figured out with many other dangerous carpenters that if you lift this up at the top of the swing, you can get a longer cut than the 12 inches that it lets you. And I'm going to demonstrate it, but I don't encourage anybody to do it for the rest of their lives like I do. Don't do that. Thanks, Dad. Place in Freeport. I mean, uh, Hempstead. Uh, they have sales and different crazy things. And for five dollars that, that day, they were selling them for 50 cents each. I bought a dozen. I spent a lot of time framing with my dad. We did a lot of construction work while I was at the School of Visual Arts. And my dad has lots of tips about framing. And this is just a couple that I could remember. 
I obviously don't do framing that much anymore and also I don't use nails that much anymore but this tip does come in handy when you need to toenail something and now toenailing means when the nail comes in at an angle now this is a trick my dad I think he learned it from his uncle James Duresta and my dad always tells me who he learned his tips from if it's pertinent information with this toenailing tip you need to bend the nail you put a curve in the nail like that and then when you toenail it the tip is that it will come down into the 2x4 more straight let's give it a try now that nail is more like that in the wood versus just straight through like that thanks dad is it raining yet? no that's 5 o'clock that's going to be heavy rain this is another framing tip if you're putting cripplers in or spacers or nailers or whatever it's always nice as a framer to have a piece that snug fits you could tap it into place so you don't have to hold it or need assistance in this case if you cut a piece or your assistant hands you a piece that doesn't fit and it's a little too loose but you don't want to waste the wood you still want to use it because it's not doing anything critical other than maybe holding sheetrock this is a tip my dad would show everybody on the job site just waste the nail. You put that nail in there and it takes up that negative space and now it's spring loaded. You could hammer it into position. And this is another tip my dad would tell me. When you're toenailing in a circumstance like this, it's always easier to toenail from the stationary 2x4. And to try and wrestle on the piece that's loose. Say sometimes you want the 2 by 4 to be snug for some reason, that you're trying to spread apart something or you're trying to lift up, or you just want it to be snug because it's a long 2 by 4 and you're working alone. You intentionally cut it long, but then you nick off one side so that it spins into place more easily, and I'll show you that. With that end chamfered, this will hammer in a little bit easier. Now, let's say, for instance, you need to move it down to here. It's in place, you gotta move it over a quarter or an eighth of an inch. I see a lot of guys will go like this, which sometimes you have to. But if you hammer it directly in the middle, the whole thing will move evenly up or down, watch. And that works for an eight foot two by four. If you hit it right in the middle, the whole entire thing will move over together. It's just been my experience. And my dad showed me that when I was a kid. What about this thing, Jimmy? Anything? Nope. This is something my dad used to do all the time when I was a kid, and I just picked it up from him. He never told anybody. He just would do it, and now I do it. You got to move a long rafter or something, and it's too big to pick up, or it's wet, or it's covered with ice, or it's covered with mud. Estimate the middle. Just pick it up. Take it where you need it. Jersey Mike's. They, the sandwich is like $15. Are they good? Yeah. I, I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> this is something I learned from my dad many years ago. How to pull a nail out with ease. Now there's a 10 penny nail that goes through there. It's right there. There's the head. Now obviously we could pull down like that, right? We could just yank it out. But my dad would always find anything on the job site. In this case, I'm going to use my Leatherman to create more leverage. It makes it so much easier to pull that nail out. You know, you're not using a lot of force. And then you could always keep jumping up the leverage to something thicker. In this case, I turn the Leatherman from this way to this way. Move it up closer. I could just grab a piece of wood. And the other good reason for doing that is you're not marring up 
this if you need to keep it clean. That entire time the hammer pivoted on something else. I did use the pliers in the beginning, but if it was something more important, I would always use a piece of soft wood to pry off of that. And so two things, you could save the surface if that's what you were trying to go for, but more importantly, the leverage makes pulling that nail out much easier. It works really well with old rusty nails that don't want to let go. Well, uh, I said to him, I said, you throw away some beautiful stuff, I take it to give to people. He says, you want it? I'll drop it off at your house. And he never did. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Pull your foot in. What I am about to describe isn't obviously a big deal anymore, but if you could put yourself in a job site 40 years ago and my dad would pull out four drills with four different drill tips and two jigsaws with two different cutting heads on them one's for metal one's for wood here you see a, a t25 the a step bit here you see a robertson's drive a countersink 35, 40 years ago, my dad would have four drills, four drivers, six jigsaws, each one of them with a different cutting head in them because he was too impatient to stop and switch them. And obviously, I do the same thing. Like I said, now with the, the, the cheapness and availability of tools, this isn't such an uncommon thing these days. But if you go back that many years ago, everybody thought my dad was bananas on a job site. He was, but for other reasons. There's a, it's a big flat sander. Oh yeah, yeah, I don't need that. Oh, you don't like that with a big muffle? I don't, I don't need it. I don't need anything. I keep flat bars around specifically because of my dad. And the main reason you want a flat bar is if you're putting a sheet of material on the wall you put this under the sheet and you step on it and you get that piece of sheet to knock up to the top of the room or whatever it is you're nailing. And I watched my dad use this flat bar a million times. You could obviously pry things open with it, but more importantly, it's really for if, you, if you're setting a door, you can get underneath it and then with your foot, you step on it and it pries that door up where you want it. This is just a nostalgic tool for me. And every time I see a flat bar, at the flea market and it's only a couple of bucks I buy them I mean I could park right here it says free parking I guess so yeah. well, yeah. Yeah, we're good we're, we're parked this I believe is an old Stanley this particular bar was another staple in my childhood in my dad's toolbox. This might even, in fact, this might even be his, but I do have several of these. This is another pry bar. Every time I see it, I buy one of these. And same thing, it's obviously a little bit heavier. Same thing, you stick it under that material, you step on that and it lifts your material up, whatever it is you're, you're trying to hang on the wall, whether it's, I remember installing paneling, that's how old I am, but really more often these days for sheetrock, if you putting in 5 eighths sheetrock, something like that. This is no tip, just a nostalgic thing. Your hair getting thin on the top? It is. Well, you got a solution for me? Another thing from my childhood is my dad never liked really bent over claw hammers like this, and neither do I. Always go for the straight claw. Always, always, you have much more versatility with a straight claw. With this, you couldn't pick up a piece of timber like I've showed before. I guess the only real good use for a hammer like this is if you're gonna be pulling nails all day long, you have a lot more leverage. If you're recycling wood or pallet recycling, for instance, you'll get a lot more leverage more often. You won't have to keep using that lift them up trick I showed. But I only buy these when I see them for a dollar or so in an S-wing. But all my hammers are straight claw hammers. They find them much more useful for demo, picking things up, prying, and whatever else. And that's also because of my dad. Battery operated Dremel. Oh, so see, what's his name? Would love this. Wow. Who that? Sal. 
give it the sell. This is the hammer I grew up with watching my dad use constantly. A lot of my dad's tools were left outside, so some of them are a little rusty. But this Stanley, probably 12 ounce head or a 10 ounce head, this is the hammer my dad always bought. He would always buy them used, he would always buy new ones, but anytime he was on a job site, he most often always had this Stanley hammer. And he would drill out the bottom and put a magnet in them. And I wish I had one. When I clean out his workshop, eventually I'll get one of those because I know he's made several over the years. This was in his outside workshop. I grabbed it a couple days ago. But he would always drill out a hole and stick a magnet in the bottom so he could reach down. And now I do the same thing with my ice pick. I don't have to reach all the way to the ground. I can just pull my ice pick out a little bit if it's far away and I could reach down and pick up something with my ice pick. But over the years I watched my dad bend down and pick up razor blades and nails and screws in the driveway by just reaching down with his hammer handle and coming up with the screw stuck to the end. This faceted Stanley hammer is emblazoned in my childhood memory. Well, wait till the spring. Wait till the spring. That's when people clean up anyway. Doesn't make a difference now. Right? While we're on the topic, this is my personal favorite hammer. My dad never loved S-wings. I always did. So growing up, I always had S-wings when I was a kid. I always used to carry the 16 the ounce with the rubber handle. Nowadays, I carry 20 ounce leather stack. I have about 10 of these and sort of as a tradition, every time I start a new TV show, which who knows when that's ever going to happen again, but in the past, every time I started a new TV show, I bought a new hammer for that show. So that's why I have about six or seven of these, or eight of these, in various states of decay. He made a meal for me that was better than, believe it or not, I was in the hospital four days. So each day I got three meals, that's 12 meals. I did not eat one. I threw 12 meals in the garbage. No good? Oh, God, it was horrible. Every f day was broccoli. You couldn't even chew it. I have these pieces of wood to demonstrate a simple technique that my dad taught me that I think of all the time. When you're going to build something, you want to make sure that all the joinery is covered up by the next piece of wood. Now this would be considered a total fail if this was in my dad's shop. You do something like that, you could see that end, you could see that end, you could see that end, you could see that end. What you want to try and do is make things, and now I'm looking at this camera, make things that cover up all your joinery as much as possible. And when I was a kid, my dad made a lot of radiator covers for other firemen that he worked with. And this is where this came into play a lot. If this is the top where your eye is going to see here, you only see that one joint. And if this is, for instance, close to the wall, no one's going to really see these side joints as much. If you were going to do dovetails of that sort of thing, then obviously you want your joints to be prominent and sexy. But when you're just putting sheet stock together, always make sure that your last piece of wood covers the previous connections and then you make it pleasing to the eye. Thank you, Dad. All, all the meat looked the same. It looked like it came from a package. But, and most of the time it was chicken. I think four or five of the meals, lunch and dinner, with a chicken leg and a, and a thigh. And I love thighs. Throw them away. Now this is a simple tip, but one that most people need to hear. And I always remember my dad teaching me to solder when I was a little kid, when we worked on plumbing pipes or whatever. These are just two copper rivets. Now this is really important when you're going to solder two things together. A lot of people start the fire and immediately stick the solder in and it just balls up and falls away. The metal needs to melt the solder, not the flame. Let's try that. Let's heat this up till the metal will melt the solder with no flame. And now I'm heating it, I'm heating it. You want to not burn it. You don't want to 
put so much heat into it that it oxidizes and that's what flux is for in this particular solder there's flux in the solder so I'm not worried about it but if you didn't have flux you'd brush that on there first but you see how the metal gets so hot that the solder will melt and in some instances that will only last for a couple seconds you gotta jump back and forth between the heat and you see it's already cooled off now you jump back and forth and while you're heating it up the solder that's on it is now beginning to flow between the joints and you see how it melts it again. Very important. It's a really important lesson that most people need to learn. Always let the metal melt the solder, not the flame. Thanks, Dad. I can go that way or should I go straight? It's straight. You gotta go on that, see that street there? Yeah. I, I don't know if you can make a left up there. That's why I might go that way and go that way. Because I right, know. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Because there's the triangles over there. Yeah, right. Now, this tip is as old as dirt, but the reason I bring it up now in the new age of battery operated tools, soaping your screws can save your battery life, believe it or not. Typically, when you're on a job site, you have 50 batteries with you, but if you're on a situation where you only have one or two, three batteries, and you need to do a lot of screws, sometimes you find yourself backed against the corner. If you can soap your screws, you will save your battery life. And my dad would always do this because back in the day, guys would use Yankees, which is a hand-driven screwdriver, or just a screwdriver, and power tools didn't exist. I don't know what the hell that is, Maybe it's a sound effect? Mm hmm. Sound effect? I guess. It's a fish. Put your hand in. Huh? This again is another tip. It might be a little obsolete now with rafter hangers and such, but every once in a while, this tip might come in handy. When you're a one man, doing a two-man job, that nail will become your partner on a job site when you need to hang something like a rafter or a floor joist or even just a two-by-four that you need to spread horizontally. You nail in that hook and now you can work on your other side. It gives you opportunity to come back over and then nail in the hanging hooked on side. I don't even go to the VA anymore. That's a hundred miles, out, 50 out, 50 back. Whoa. Wait, somebody broke your mirror? No. Huh? What's broken? Oh, what's that? A camera? Yeah. If you made it this far, thank you. And I just want to say thanks, Dad. Thanks for teaching me how to make stuff and always putting dangerous tools in my hands without ever for one second worrying if I was going to get hurt. People make fun of me for not being safe. You should have grew up with my dad. It's a wonder that he made it to 83 with the practices that that he would do on job sites. But that being said, thank you all very much. I've been posting a lot of exclusive content to Patreon, so if you're curious, you can go over there and check it out. It's only $1 a month. Certain videos that the algorithm wouldn't favor here in a public YouTube setting, I'm putting over there. So if you're inclined, go check that out. And thank you for hanging out with me. Going on 13 years now. Thank you. It was a cop. I said, I was the guy telling me I know that, that I know what I got to do. So I didn't like him at all. And and then uh, one day we went on a job. I was I was in the other section though. But one day I was transferred to that for the day. Me and him, and we were on a job. And uh, he was the he had the nozzle and I was behind him. And he. And as we're fighting over there, uh, as we're fighting the jump, he goes, come on, get up here. And he grabs me and says, take the nozzle. And uh, and he, like, watched over me. <laughs> and from that point on, I just dismissed whatever negative thoughts yeah. I had. Now the story goes, I'll say any nasty thing about him, but the first guy that agrees with me gets punched in the mouth. Because uh, uh, he became a close friend we, uh, from that time on. Yeah. We've been friends about 50, 60 years now.